anything on a CAD program? Um, it's been a while. It's been a while? Okay, so fair enough. So since we are going over with 11th to 12th graders, since the first step is design or to make something, and that's the idea, we want them to get experience from using that design iteration process, and we want to also have them the experience of the CAD program. Because those, both of those skills are great for problem solving, great for learning, and then also the CAD program can actually be utilized in a real life work pro environment. Because a lot of people right now, it keeps booming that a ton of people are using computer-aided design, whether design shoes, anything that we're really using as consumers now are designed in CAD programs. So um, the first one I'm gonna recommend is Onshape because it is entirely free and it's cloud-based. So if you have like Chromebooks or something like that, you can utilize it. Um, and you don't need anything else. It's called O N S H A P E. It's completely free. All you have to do is sign up with an email, and then you should be able to log in. And it's cloud based, so it's on web browser simply. And then you can just kind of go over the initial start of it. So it is a traditional CAD program, so you will start with sketches or 2D sketches. So like you, if you were to create this rectangle, you would place this rectangle on this flat surface, and then we would extrude the rectangle, and it would actually come out into a three dimensional object. And so that's kind of how the CAD program is going to work. And then you could, of course, rotate it to the side and kind of look at it in different views, stuff like that. So you can do that exactly the same with like a cylinder. You could even extrude this shape. So if you took this shape and sketched it on a flat plane, just in the exact same way, and pulled it out, and then you could end up cutting out the shapes necessary for the software. So that's kind of the idea working behind it. So on shape is a good free one if you don't want to do too much effort. Um, it, the, another one that is free for educators and students, and I can send you the link for that one um, to sign up for your class or otherwise, you need an EDU email in order to log into it, or at least a school, US, AR, K-12, whatever it may be. Okay. And then just a domain used by schools. Then you should be able to sign up for free for a three-year license on Fusion 360. And that's my preferred uh, CAD program because I initially learned in Inventor, Auto, Autodesk Inventor, and it's very, very similar. And it's a much smaller file size and easier to manage. So everything's kind of stored into the cloud so you can access it anywhere and you should still have all your files. Um, so Fusion 360 is a really good one that I prefer. So we can always go over more of that if you would like at some point. But now we can kind of, the one thing we're going to want out of that design process is going to be an STL file. And that's the first file type. So just .stl or .obj. Those are kind of intermittently. I use STL as kind of cover all for both, both of those. Okay. So we're going to take that STL file and we're going to place it inside of Kira or our slicing program. So if you have the little USB and the SD card that came with your printer, we should be able to put that into our printer and install the program. Once it pulls up, you should see three different folders. You should see Kira, STL, and test prints. And then also the user manual should be on there. And you can go ahead and open up Kira. And inside Kira, you should also see a application option for you to run. It's going to be four six. Two. So there is a USB port on here. On which one? There's a USB port on the machine. Uh, no, the oh, okay. key card that is in the back of it is what goes inside the machine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a micro USB port, but it's not quite the same. So we're going to go ahead and plug in that USB to the computer itself. Okay, okay, all right, all right. Yeah, sorry, sorry. This is going to be like on the computer end. Okay. Uh, my bad. My bad. That, was, that was my fault. I was just, I was uh, gung ho. Yeah, you were kind of looking at it like, there's no USB on this. That's crazy. <laughs> okay. All right, it's plugged into the computer now. Awesome, perfect. So when it pulls up, you should see three different folders inside of it, and we're going to go to the Cura folder for now, and then we're going to double click on the application for install. Now we'll say that. Oh, hold on a second. Sorry. You're good. Okay. Uh, my, uh, my IT guy already, uh, already installed Cura. Okay, what version? 
Uh, he went, I think it's 2.7. If it is 2.7, we can go over that one, and I'd be happy to. We're actually about to swap to 2.7 for all our instructional videos. Um, been using 1504 just because it's simple and easy, but 2.7 asks offers so much more robust things that you can do and options that that's why we're swapping. Okay. So if you do have 2.7 on there, go ahead and start Cura 2.7. It takes, usually takes a little bit to boot it. So go ahead and type in Cura, find it, and 2.7 will be great for us. Uh, yeah, it's in and it's on uh, Add Printer. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to load mine and mine's going to have to, I'll have to navigate to a different thing real quick in order to get there. So let's hit cancel on the old Cura. Close out of that one. We won't need that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. When I share my screen, it automatically maximizes it. All you have to do is hit the escape key and it should go back down. Sure. All right. So my Cura is going, going to go ahead and load. So all we want to put inside of Cura is those STL files. STLs are basically a big mesh. And I say mesh, but it's a basically a net of triangles. So it's triangles connected by their corners and by their edges to create a shape out of triangles. So you can create, you know, circular shapes, anything. If you have enough triangles, it'll express. And that's what we're loading into this area. So as you may see, yours, let me set mine to where it probably looks a lot like yours. And then printer, add printer. Okay, so does yours look like this? Uh, yes. Perfect. So now what we're going to do is the first thing we want to choose custom. So we're going to set up the options for our printer and then we'll talk about printer settings or the basically model settings. So here, go ahead and click custom and then we're going to change the name to NWA 3D A5. Then hit add printer. I have one. Second to load. And then it should pull up machine settings. Well, it, lo it went once, uh, once I went back to my screen, it's not showing the printers anymore. So, where I can click custom printer. Oh, oh, uh, see if it's behind it. Um, Sometimes that menu will pop up behind the area. Yeah, I don't see it anywhere. If not, then you can go back to settings on the toolbar. Sure. And click machine or printer and then click add new printer. Okay, then custom printer. Yep, select custom in NWA 3D A5. NWA 3D A5. Perfect. A5 is the type of printer, and then the brand is obviously NWA 3D. All right, add printer. Sweet. And then it should pull up this machine settings afterwards, right? Yes. Takes a little second, but it will. Okay. So we're gonna change a couple of these values and then we should be good to move on. So first off on the X, Y, and Z, we will be changing those. So the first value, we're gonna change it to 125. And that's gonna be about five inches. The Y or depth is going to be 150, right around six. And then finally the height can be left at 100, which is about four inches. Okay. All right, and then we don't have to worry about any of these settings over here. We can leave those as they are. The only other one we need to change is material diameter. We want to change that to 1.75 millimeters. So that's talking about the actual material we'll put into the printer. And if you look at the side of your spool, it should say size 1.75. So if you go to buy any more filament or otherwise, make sure you're purchasing that type. Okay. And then we can click finish. And that's all the setup we need for our initial machine settings. And now we need to go over the settings for how our print or how our model will turn out from it. So first off, it probably looks a lot like this. We're going to swap this from recommended to custom. Okay. Then yours is gonna be kind of like so. Should have all these concatenated like that. And we're going to change. So first off, I wanna kind of point out that up here at this drop down box, you can select different printers if you had multiple installed. And then here you have material, and we want to select PLA because that's the type of material we use. And then the profile, we're going to edit this fine profile and then save a new one to make sure everything's set. And we can always just go back to that profile if we need anything. Okay. okay. 
Awesome. So we're going to go step by step through these a little bit, and I'll just explain them shortly. If you want more of an explanation, if you hover over it, it does show you everything it affects and gives you a description of what it is. Okay, so first off here under quality, if we click the drop down box, it should say layer height. The layer height determines the utmost quality or how our print will look. 0 0.1 is about the highest quality these printers work at. 0 0.3 is gonna be the lowest that you're probably gonna to wanna to print. And conversely, a lower quality uses less plastic, less time. High quality uses more time, more plastic. So I'm gonna change this to 0 0.2 just for the sake of the tutorial. And then we can open up shell. And under shell, we want both the wall and top and bottom thickness to be 0 0.8. Okay. These values should be a multiple of your nozzle size. So since we set our nozzle, or we saw our nozzle and machine settings, it said 0 0.4, and we wanna make sure that these are a multiple of it. That's because if one pass of the nozzle lays down 0.4, a second pass lays down 0.8, and that'll be the thickness of our walls. Okay. So if I wanted a more of a wall on my model, I would have to go to 1.2, 1.6, and so on. Okay. And if you have any questions, please stop me, feel free to. I'd love to answer your questions. So here we have infill density. This determines the durability of the print. So I'm gonna change this value for now to 10%, and I'll change it here in a little bit to show you what it actually does inside of a model. Do you want me to change mine as you're changing? Yeah, that would be perfect, yeah. And so the, a lot of them are almost already preset and don't necessarily need to be changed, um, but there are a couple that we wanna make sure that we do. All right, so here on material, this is gonna be one we do wanna change. We wanna change the printing temperature to 220. This is simply because the, t the PLA that we are using has an extra composite it takes a little bit more heat to liquefy it, and we find that it prints really, really well at 220. And that's just our preferred printing temperature. Other people will have different ones. So diameter, we're gonna leave that at 1.75, that is correct. Flow, this is going to be how much material is extruded. So if I increase this value by 10%, it's going to release 10% extra filament as it prints. That's simply what this does, we don't usually change this value. Retraction, it makes our prints nicer. It helps to not leave strands hanging off. I'm gonna close that one, that one's good. I'm gonna change that one here a little bit, there we go. Speed, we're going to wanna to change the print speed to 50 millimeters per second. So if we delete this value and type in 50, that's what we're gonna want. And there may be a value you're noticing that you don't have right now and we'll touch base on. So print speed first off, we don't wanna go greater than 50. You can print at 60, it just tends to make your prints ugly or coarse, and then it also has the possibility to mess your prints up. So we like to say 50 is the max speed. You can go lower, it can one, improve quality, and it can also improve like overhangs or something that isn't quite supported. Travel speed at 120 is perfectly fine, and then we also want to change the initial layer speed. So you might not see this, so if you hover over the drop down box here on speed, you see this little gear? Go ahead and click on the gear, and it should bring up something, the dialog preferences for setting visibility. Now, if you notice, there is a ton of settings, and this is what I meant by Cura 2.7 has all of these settings. So if you scroll up and down, you'll be able to see that there's much more than what we are experiencing. Tons and tons more. So we want to make sure we're under the speed and select initial layer speed directly under travel speed. Gotcha. Okay. And then you can go ahead and hit close, and then you should see this value. So the reason we change this is just so that very first layer that it puts down, we wanna make sure that it adheres really well and it looks good. So I'm gonna change this value to 15 millimeters per second. Okay, and then we have cooling. We wanna make sure that checkbox is there. That should be good. And support, go ahead and click on the generate support box. We can change this value here in a little bit, but we wanna use it for now, just for an example and we can put support placement as everywhere. Um, this is good for first starting 3D printing if you haven't had much experience with it. Some models that you place into it will have overhangs or something that is kind of like floating in air and supports help to generate area underneath it so that it can print that area. 
And then we should have belt plate adhesion. And I'm gonna change this value to a skirt. So the brim is exactly as it sounds. It helps to adhere it to the build area. So it helps it to stick. The brim is going to use just kind of like a fanned out plastic around it. And it's probably the only value I usually use. Rafts tend to be a little bit too much plastic and too much time for me. Um, so you use these if you have a small surface area object. So like if you're printing a pencil or something or a pen, you'll probably in it standing upright, you'll want to build plate adhesion to keep it steady. So I'm going to use skirt, and then we should be good on all of our settings that we need. Okay. So now that we kind of have our settings preset, I want to save this profile so that we don't mess it up at any point. So if we click on the star next to the profile, then it's going to pull up our preferences for profiles. And all we need to do is we need to click create here in the top and then name it a new one. So we can just say base A5 settings. And that's, that's so if you have any problems, if you feel like anything's wrong with Kira, you can always go back to these settings and you'll know that they're easy and done. Okay? And then we'll just click okay. And then it should generate it and then we can click close. There we go. So now the profile says that and we should be good. Yep. So next, the only part now is to load in a file and then kind of discuss about how we move it and everything. So here in the top left, you'll notice that there's an open file tab. Click on that and then navigate to your SD card. So my SD card already pulled up. And we're going to go into test prints. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. We're going to go into STL files because remember from the design, we have an STL. So that's what we want to put in here. So go to the STL files and select the six-sided dice. And then it should look much like this. Okay. Sometimes if it doesn't register right, I like to unplug it and plug it back in. Yeah. It'd be a little finicky, the SD card in the back of it sometimes. Let me try it on this other side here. Sure thing. So STL files and load in the six sided dice. Is it still being mad at you? Yeah, it's not uh it's not showing it at all. Try reinserting the SD card into the back of it. So pull the USB part out and reinsert the SD card and then plug it back in. I find that it's not the USB reader, it's the SD card that goofs. So SD file, STL files. Uh huh. And then yeah. in the six sided dice. And click open. Yep. And then it should pop up in the middle, kind of yellow like this one, right? Yep. So, first off, let's talk about camera controls so you kind of know how to move it around. If we right click, it rotates. If you click in on a mouse button, it can actually go pan side to side. I think also shift and right click does the same thing if you don't have a mouse button. And then if you zoom in and out with the mouse wheel, that works as well. Okay. So that's kind of camera controls for you. And then if we left click on the object, we get a couple different options. So it allows us to manipulate it so we can move, we can scale it proportionally or not, we can rotate it, and then we can mirror it over an axis. So first off, if we want to move it, we could even cut this model in half and only print half of the model just by moving it underneath like that. Or we can right click and center selected model and pull that back to zero here so that we know it's sitting on it. So you can also, you can type in values here or you can pull the arrows. Now scale, exact same thing, we can either grab these or we can type in percentage numbers or X values. 
If you want it to not uniform scale, unclick the box and it'll do it however you would like. Then we have rotate and rotate is very important because print orientation helps a lot. So just for the sake of the tutorial, I'm gonna lay this right on its side kind of like so to generate supports underneath it so that I can kind of show you. Okay. So that's not gonna print great and it's gonna increase our print time if we print it on the side like this but it does give you a good example of what would be required for supports. So this angle would need them. Do you want me to do that? No, 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 you're good. You can leave it flat on there. So next, what we're gonna do is we're going to do a different view mode. So go ahead, right underneath. So the only other option is mirror and it flips it 180 degrees, pretty simple. Um, the view mode though, we're gonna select layers here. Okay. And you might see that it has material color and it's all one color like yellow. Yes. Click the drop down box and select the line type. And now you should see multiple different colors. Gotcha. In this case, the red is the exterior shell. So that's determined by your shell. And then the green, if we grab the slider and move it down, you'll notice I just cut into the object, right? Yep. So here the red is the outside shell, the green is the inside shell. If I were to increase my shell wall thickness, it would increase that value, the green wall, by more, right? So the first wall is always going to be 0.4, and then you can make the inner wall larger and larger. Now, let's also, let's take a look at the infill density. So the yellow, this orangey yellow, is the infill or the durability of your object, okay? And then the yellow here is going to be your top and bottom areas. So it's considering quite a bit to be top and bottoms just because of the letters and numbers on the side. And so this orange is infill, yellow is top and bottom. And so if I change my infill density, let's say, let's change it to 20% and it's going to re-slice it here in a second. There it goes. So if it's gray, then it's slicing. You'll notice the bar here. And notice now that there's a higher density of objects inside of it. So that's going to increase how strong it is. And then we have another one to talk about. This light blue is supports. So the supports are trying to make sure to generate something underneath so that whenever we get to that area, it'll print successfully like that. Okay. And so that's going to be our first layer. So we don't even have the object touching. And then it'll generate the first object on the second layer. And so you can kind of pan through those to kind of view what's going on with the cube. And I very much like to check the first layer because it gives you a good idea if your print's gonna su be successful or not. So I like to always check level one and then move it up and double check and see if everything's all right. So I'm gonna rotate mine now because we don't need it in that position. And we'll lay it flat. And now there might be supports here on the side. That's just because new Cura wants to make sure everything's pretty. We don't necessarily need it because this cube prints perfectly without supports, so we can unclick it. So unclick the generate support value. I just wanted to make sure you knew that's there and that you should usually on most enable. All right, so run that by me one more time. So the supports here are generated on the side. So you see how there's all this blue caked over your model? Right, and then I can unclick. Yep. Oh, uh, uh, on the. Yep, under support, and then it should take all that away. And then the blue on the outside that you see, that's the skirt that we decided earlier about. And so that helps to prime the nozzle, this little ring. Right. Okay. So now it will print perfectly like this. So as you get more and more used to 3D printing, you'll know what needs and doesn't need supports. And that's just a practice deal. So that's why we saved the settings of your base A5 with generate support. So students don't load something in and it becomes a plate of spaghetti because they're trying to print in midair. Okay, so perfect. That's all of the model that we need to kind of talk about. The only thing you might want to see is there's a couple of views right here at the bottom right hand corner of the window. It has the name, the size of the print, the time it'll take, and the material usage. So those are nice to have and nice to see. So I like to save to file. So if you click down on the little arrow here in the right hand corner, bottom right hand, you click save to file. This is my preferred method because I'm picky about how it saves. So click save to file and then name it whatever you would like. So I'm going to name it dice and save it inside my SD card. Just like so. So make sure it's a G code. So that's the second type of file. 
So we import STLs and we export G code. So click save, and then you should see it saved down here. And then we can eject our SD card now because we're done here. I'm going to close Kira, and then I'm just going to eject my SD card real quick, like so. Cool. I can close Kira. Yep, you sure can. Okay. So that was a long second step. Usually it doesn't take nearly that long because you don't have to change all of the settings. Um, when you first set it up with students, I like to go through those base settings and the things like that so that they kind of get an idea of what's what and you can kind of give them an explanation of what's going on. Okay. So the third step is transfer. So we made, we had an SDL, now we're exported as a G code from Kira, which is step two. And then three is transferring that SD card, the micro SD card in the back of the USB and putting it into the printer. You can take it and underneath the button, if you look directly underneath the button, you should be able to find a small slot on the board that it plugs into. And so it should just click into place. Perfect, okay. So the rest of this, the fourth step to print, that was all of step three, step three is easy. The fourth step is just to click print from SD card on the printer. So if you wanna plug the printer in, or if it already is, then you need to go down to refresh SD card. So click the button once. So we click to select and then scroll either way to go down, up and down. So click once, and then we can go down to re refresh SD card and then go to print from SD and we should be able to see our file that we just saved. So before we click on that, we want to make sure that we have everything ready for our printer. So that would be all of the steps to print, right? And then if your printer is already set up and it has filament and everything ready to go, all you would have to do is finish and click print from SD. But we kind of recently got our printers. We don't know if they're level. We don't have any filament in it, so on and so forth. We're going to go over those troubleshooting steps now. So first off, the first troubleshooting step that you would check on is Cura. You'd be amazed how big of a deal that ends up being. I just did a follow-up training with some wonderful library technicians, and they wondered why no models would work, but it was all because of their Cura settings. They just had them a little bit wrong, and that was causing the issue. So that's the first thing to kind of check. We've gone over it. We know that we're doing that right. Number two is mechanical inspection. So we want to make sure the motors are plugged in, make sure that they can move to, you know, correctly, make sure that nothing's jammed or anything like that. So we're gonna check four motors, three limit switches, and two belts. So first off, if I turn it to the right, on the side of the yellow screen, we should be able to see this horizontal bar has two white tabs here on the outside. So here and here. And this is our X motor, should be labeled X. And then inside is going to be the X limit switch, and we just want to double check, make sure those are plugged in. And then we have, if we rotate further to the back, we should have directly next to it should be an E motor. So right here. And it has a yellow trigger up here at the top. That's where we figure filament through. The E stands for extruder, and it helps to push the filament from here all the way through this tube into the hot end. Okay. Then we're, if we look directly down, we're going to have the Z motor down here. We wanna make sure the Z motor is plugged in. And then if we look directly from the left of the Z motor, we should see the Y motor, which is back here. You can't see it. You can always pull your build plate forward. Okay, and then we also have a limit switch. Then with the last limit switch we need to look at is the Z one, which is underneath the carriage, right above the screen. And this is our, these are our stop points. This is where basically it goes until it hits these and says, hey, stop, this is zero, okay? And then we have two belts, one that the carriage, this head carriage runs on, and then one that the base plate runs on, okay? So we wanna make sure those are pretty smooth and that they're not snagging or anything, okay? Yeah, any questions about basic printer inspection? I'm, I'm sure you'll understand whatever you do encounter a mechanical error. Um, it's pretty obvious. So like I just had a service request today that they were making lines just like this. And it was a big blob of plastic here. And that's because the X motor was unplugged and it wasn't able to move side to side. So that kind of thing will be obvious. 
and usually you can find those errors, errors pretty easy. Okay, so the third step is going to be probably the first, hardest step at the beginning, and it's called leveling the build plate. This is the biggest error, or the one of the two biggest errors that we find with 3D printers. So this is the one if you never take it apart, of course, this is generally your problem. A lot of people can't level their bed correctly, as either that's too far away or too close, and they don't know what to look for. So that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna level, let me move this up. So I'm moving this up just by turning the spiral uh, in the back. And you can do that if you want, but it kind of gets you a little grease on your hands, but that's what we have so far, right? So if we look underneath here, we can see this small nozzle, right? This nozzle is what we want to level to the build plate. And we want to have a 200 micron gap. So very, very small. And we're going to do, use a piece of paper in order to find that. So if you had a, have a piece of paper available, that would be perfect. So what we're going to do is we're going to take it and we're going to fold it in half. So any printer paper or whatever may work, kind of up to you. So we're going to take that paper, fold it a hamburger style. I prefer that horizontal. This makes it a little bit easier. Okay, and then we're going to, I'm going to push this down a little bit just by pushing on it and rotating it. So it's closer, so it doesn't take as long. And I'm going to click on the button once and then go to setup and then go to auto home. So you can do this with me. So you can level the build plate there. So setup and auto home. And then it should go to its origin point, which is this front left corner. So click once, set up, click twice, auto home, and then we're good. Yeah, seems like it's moving. You kind of put your hands away from it. Yes. On the top left corner? Yep, top left corner. That's it. Okay. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna click the button again because once you auto home, it locks everything. It locks it in a place for safety terms because it's starting to prepare to print is the idea. So we're gonna click on it once, go back to sit up and go to disable motors. That is right below auto home. So you disable motors whenever it's finished moving. Okay, and now we can move them around again. We're gonna take a look at three kind of knobs that are underneath this build plate. So I'm gonna rotate to the side just to show you the easy two and tilt it up. Usually you wanna keep yours flat on the surface to level it, but I wanna show you where they are. So here, you notice it's a black knob and then a spring of directly above it. So by adjusting these, we can pull this bill plate up and down. And so we have three points. We have one here, one back here, and then we have one on the inside. So in between the two. So like that one's a little bit hard to see but it's right inside of here. Don't you love those automatic lights? This one goes off at the slightest. I'm in here moving. I know it. <laughs> I had the same thing whenever I was out of school. It just wouldn't, wouldn't stay on. All right, so we have the springs, and we're going to line up our print head or that nozzle I showed you earlier. We want to put it directly above this inside one first. So this is going to be the hardest one. It can be a little tedious, but the next two will be super easy compared to. So we're going to line this up right about like so. And I'll kind of put you a side view so you can kind of see what I'm trying to do. So I want this nozzle to try and be right above the spring like so. So just a you know, rough estimate. It's usually pretty good. You don't have to be super exact, but you notice there's a spring and then the nozzle. So right about there should be good for me. And then we're going to adjust that knob to bring the bill plate up. So mine's definitely too low. So if we put the piece of paper in between, we should feel a resistance between the nozzle. If yours is, which one's yours? Too high or too low? Mine, the paper will not go. Underneath? It will not go underneath. Perfect. So since it is on springs, we can actually push down on this build plate and it'll actually shrink it like that. So if you push down on the build area and then push your paper underneath, it should be good. So it, it is pretty pressure sensitive, so you're going to have to push down pretty hard and then slide the paper underneath. And if that's the case, then it's probably too tight. 
So in order to lower the build area, we want to go counterclockwise. So a little diagram to kind of give you an idea. If we're looking at it top down, this is counterclockwise, and then this is going to go up. So if we think of it looking down on it is how I think about it, and it's pretty much the easiest. Okay. The paper. We want to go counterclockwise. The paper's in there. Okay. And it's just cool. Yeah, so though if you pull this back out and then adjust the knob, so you're going to go this direction until you can kind of slide the paper back and forth and feel like it's almost vibrating. It should have a small amount of drag. So mine's too far away, so I'm going to let it go up. And that's just on the knob, the, the one underneath? Uh, yeah. So we're going to adjust the knob underneath until we start to be able to move that piece of paper. And so now mine kind of has, you can almost hear it rubbing against the paper and that's what we're looking for. But you want to be able to move it back and forth with like say a couple fingers and then not be crinkling. So it's going to be a sweet spot in between the drag and not too tight. So it's just something to get used to. You'll get better and better at it and so will your students as they do it more often. Uh, you, you shouldn't have to do this super often unless you're moving your printers a lot. Okay. <clears throat> and so if you feel comfortable with that one, you can move to the one on the outside. Or if you feel a little bit tough on this one, go ahead and move to the outside and try and adjust this one out here. So I'm going to move it like this, give you a side view, because this one's much easier to demonstrate. Like that. Paper underneath. And mine is much too far away there. So I'm going to go clockwise, clock up, count down. Okay. And there we go. So now I feel All right. All right. a certain amount of resistance whenever it's in between the two. You want to try and get them all at the same amount of resistance so that you know it's as close as possible to being level at each spot. I wish there was a better way to communicate it, but it's just really kind of like touch and feel. It's almost sensory. I think I got them all. Sweet. So you did you get this one back here? Yes. Awesome. I need to check mine real fast. <clears throat> so I don't know about back here. Oh, that's way too low again. There we go. You can almost hear it kind of rub against it. Perfect. So now that we have that 200 micron gap, we should be good to go for it to lay down correctly. But I want to double check and make sure that I didn't have any plastic on my nozzle because I know I did before so. So I'm going to move it up just by grabbing the axis in the back. And I can move it up. We can also move it up from the screen if you would prefer to do that. You don't want students to touching the axis. If you click on the button, you can go down to controls, and then select move axis at the bottom, and move one millimeter, and move Z. And it should be able to go up and down. And then you can adjust it like so. So if you go up to about 20 or so, that should be more than good. And that's a way to manually do it so you don't have to touch that back spiral or adjust it. Cool. To go back, just click on the button once and then go back up through the menus. Okay. So what we're going to do now, this is the base menu right after clicking once. We're going to go down to setup. And since we're a little bit off, now we can heat it up. Because originally I didn't want to heat it up because if it's on the build plate, it can have little burn marks. So you'll notice like right here, there's a little pop mark from it burning into it. We want to try and avoid that because our things are nice. Let's not try and burn into it. That's my idea. And students, it helps to tell students that we want to keep our things nice because I know how it can be. So once we do that, we can click on the button, 
go down to setup and preheat PLA. So there's going to be two values. There's preheat soft pool and preheat PLA. So I'm kind of moving into the filament, the fourth issue, by talking about these. But when you click on preheat PLA, it's going to heat to 220 degrees. When you click on preheat soft pool, it's going to heat to 200, or it's going to heat to 100 degrees. So the soft pool helps us to remove any old colors or material whenever we're pulling out filament. So go from a state of zero to 100 to have that transition phase. So it's solid to a transition. And then when we pull it out, it's gonna be a little bit tough and a little bit hard to remove, but it's help, gonna help get all that gunk out, all the old plastic and the stuff like that. So it's what you should do every time you remove filament, perform a soft pull from coal. So go ahead and click on preheat PLA because we want to heat it all the way up to 220. So set up preheat PLA. And now it should say on your screen, you should have a 220 degree value here at the top. And then below the nozzle diagram is going to be a number that keeps ticking up and that's your current temperature. And so it should build up to 220 degrees with the desired temperature. And then we can auto home again and check our leveling real quick before we move on to the last of the filament issues. All right, 220. Okay. So if that's 20, then what you can do is go click on the button, go back to setup, and go back to auto home. And then remember, once it's at home, you have to disable motors before you can move it. So put your piece of paper at the origin point so that it doesn't burn into the build area. And then we're just going to test around the build plate real quick, see if everything's still level. So the reason I did this is because by heating up the nozzle, if there was any plastic on it, we can now knock it off and make sure that we didn't level just to the nozzle itself. The line is now at home, so I'm going to disable motors, set up disable motors. Now I can move it around again. And fun fact, mine is even looser than it was before, even though I leveled. So I must have knocked some sort of plastic off, and now I have a bigger gap than I want. Okay, so we go back to... Sorry, once we get it, what did it oh. We go back and set up. Yep, set up in auto home. If it's at home, then go set up disable motors so that we can move it. So we heated it up just to knock plastic off the novel to make sure that whatever extrudes is the correct distance. So mine definitely had plastic because mine's too loose now. And so if yours feels fine, then you can go ahead and just twist the axis in the back to move it back up. Once you kind of test around the build area, I'm going to have to adjust mine because mine's a little bit off. So I'm going to have to move mine up. Because I had apparently a lot of plastic on the nozzle. There we go. I did a whole full turn in order to get mine there. All right. Sweet. So once you have it like that, remember it is heated, so we are going to want to move it off the build area as to not burn it. So I'm going to just twist it in the back real quick and then move the X carriage up. Perfect. So now is only filament steps left. So we talked about the soft pool. It helps to remove old colors, move clogs, and also clear out this extruder assembly. Secondly, in order to load the filament, first we have to click preheat PLA. Now we can take our filament spool. If you have one with you. We can unbind it from the side, like the storage side, so they do have holes on the side to store it. Uh, take it out from there, and I'm going to have to clip mine. So if you notice, mine is kind of a little bit weird and finicky looking. That's because I performed a soft pull when I pulled it out. So that's kind of a way it should look. So I'm going to clip it to be a sharper edge. So I'm just going to clip it at an angle like this. And then I have my edge. 
we're going to feed this through the hole next to the z-axis spiral right back here. So this one can be a little tedious to find sometimes, but it's right in the back above the E motor. Let's push it through the rest of the way. We have to squeeze the trigger and then push it through the entire tube until you hit resistance and it won't go anymore. So it should be quite a bit of feeding in order to get it all the way there. And once you get it there, push a little bit extra. And then we should be able to take a look at our nozzle. And we should see plastic has come out of it. Should be, should be some coming out of the nozzle. Yep, if you don't see any, then go ahead and push more. Yeah, I, see, I, see, I mean, I see. Kind of blobbed up like this. It's, uh, well, must have been some purple on the test or something. Exactly, that's exactly what it was. So that's why we kind of do this right here at the start. For one, it pushes out old colors, and then it also primes the nozzle so it has enough pressure to print. Gotcha. So once you kind of see that there's enough and you have your correct color coming through, you can kind of grip it with tools or whatever you like. Okay. And then you can remove that and take it away. And so now mine is all gray because my last color was gray, so it should be good. So if you still see the old color coming out, you can push even more just by squeezing that trigger in the back until you remove the entire old color, and then you can start your print. So the only other thing I wanna talk about for filament is you do have a small needle in your kit. This is used to floss your nozzle if you have a clog. So it may be in the other bag, it should have a little like styrofoam head to it on one end. It's gonna be in the bag with the blue table. Well, it's pretty easy to miss because it is super, super tiny. Well, it may be around there, but yeah. in the essence, I just wanted to make sure you knew it was there or that you should have it. Um, and this is used to floss the nozzle if you do get a bad clog. You heat it up to 220 and then you just floss the nozzle underneath, right? Perfect. Okay, so the only other thing we have to do is click print. We also wanna talk about one other thing to prevent clogs. If it's heated, like it is now, it has filament inside of it and it's not printing, it can be dangerous if left a long time. So if you leave it for like 10 minutes, what's gonna happen is that, fil that filament that's hitting, sitting in that hot area right inside here is going to get so hot and it's going to turn into a black clog, a carbon clog, and it'll cause problems. So obviously, if you do have it heated or you walk by a printer and it's heated and not doing anything, just unplug it. It's your fail safe for these printers. If anything's happening and it seems like it's bad, you can always just pull the plug out and it's not gonna hurt them. You will have to restart the print, okay? It's gonna have to wait. Cool, so the only thing left to do, they shouldn't have to wait long, is click the button once, scroll down to print from SD card, and select dice.g code, or whatever you saved it as. Cool, so it should say heating down here at the bottom of the screen. Well, it, uh, print from SD card. Yep. And I've got, so see if you can find it inside of uh, STL files. So I may saved back into that folder. Hmm. 
Not there either. Okay, well, you can use the test prints, so you don't need to reslice it, it should be okay. Inside of the test prints file, or test prints folder, you should see a dice and a keychain, and you can schedule one of those to print, and you can always remember that we might have not saved it to the right place this time. So, prints are Yep. I don't know what it's, what it's doing, but it's uh, when I go print from this, it's just giving me back A5 spool holder. A5 spool holder. So click on the back. Okay. And then do you see? Test prints. Yep. Okay. So you were just inside another folder. Yeah. And then I can just print either one of these. Yes. And then it should say on the screen, it should say heating down here once you select one. Yes. And then it'll move to its origin point or the leftmost corner, and then it'll start printing. So go ahead and watch the first layer and make sure that it goes down and then we're good to go. So once it starts to move to the middle area, you should be able to see it kind of put the skirt that we programmed earlier and then print the square. If you notice here on the side, you can kind of see my plastic laying down already. Gotcha. Yep, and so we want to just make sure it's sticking to the build plate. If it's not sticking, then it's too low. And if it doesn't seem to want to extrude anything, it's probably too close. So those are the first two kind of troubleshooting things. Like we like to watch the first layer of every single print to make sure that it'll actually work. And we check for those two things that it's actually sticking. How's yours doing, David? Uh, it's doing it. Heck yeah. Uh, is it sticking to the build area? Um, I mean, it looks like it is. Sweet, if it looks like it is, it probably is. Because you, you'd be able to tell if it wasn't. <laughs> awesome. So that's all of it. Great. You got any questions for me? I know there was a lot of information. You're probably still kind of working through some of it, but. Um, I don't think so. I mean, they're probably. Uh, yeah, and that's what I'm here for. So you can always email us. You can always email support. Um, we have a couple videos on the support page if you kind of want to go over any of these again. Uh, I'll also send you this recording here in a follow-up email probably this afternoon around 5 o'clock. Uh, so. If nothing else, then I appreciate your time, and I hope you learned something. All right. Thank you very much for helping me out. Yeah, of course. Have, have fun 3D printing. All right. Thank you.